Greetings, gentle people. I'm John Hagen, one half of the Shift by Alberta Innovates podcast team. Welcome, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar. A few things before we start. We encourage participation, and a good way to participate is to dive into the group chat below the screen with me in it. Another good way is to interact with our guest by asking questions. You can use the Q&A function also below the screen. Now, a few words about our guest. David Sachs is an entrepreneur, analyst, and author of Revenge of Analog and the Soul of an Entrepreneur. There's something that unites all entrepreneurs, from the family-run restaurant to retirees starting a consultancy. It's their personal purpose, the core values that keep them strong when faced with challenges and that push them to persevere. How can you tap into those values like independence, ethical engagement, and community to galvanize your team? And how can you empower yourself and your colleagues to think like entrepreneurs? Well, David's going to answer and explore how to ignite that entrepreneurial mindset, and he's going to answer your questions along the way. So don't be shy and ask questions. Gentle people, David Sachs. Take it away, David. Thank you, John. Uh, and thank you, gentle people. It's always nice to, to speak to gentle people because um, I've spoken to the opposite and it's a lot less fun. So uh, <laughs> we're here for um, today's Lunch and Learn. Um, now, normally, this would be in person, uh, maybe at a banquet hall or a sort of hotel ballroom. So to get that authentic experience, what I like to say to people in these events is go take a chicken breast, uh, microwave it for about 10 minutes in the oven until it's really overdone. Um, <laughs> uh, take some like sad looking limp carrots and, and some boiled peppers, throw that on top of it and a little thimble of rice um, and, uh, you know, uh, charge, um, I don't know, $50 for that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here though. I'm all prepared. I, I told John, I just took have a dry cleaning bag. That's at least a year old. Uh, I was like, Oh, a button down shirt. What a novelty. Uh, and I got a haircut last night. My, uh, my wife and my four-year-old son gave me the haircut. Um, and, and the, the, the part of that is I'm now hiding out in the basement of my next door neighbor's house um, because my kids got sent home yesterday for 14 days with a COVID um, exposure at their school. So I am very pleased to be here and I may just let this drag on a little longer to avoid um, what's on the other side of that wall and upstairs with uh, two kids running around without any structure. Anyway, how are y'all doing? Good? Okay? Crappy? There's no need to sugarcoat it. It's been a tough year for most of us, um, lockdowns, sessions, tremendous stress uh, in our personal lives and obviously in our work lives. Um, you know, if you're running a business, you've probably had to put huge investments into figuring out how to retool your workplace or how to get everybody working remotely. Um, and just as you figure that out, you think it had set and you think the market, you know, you found a niche everything changes. The science changes, the regulations shift. And then as soon as it goes one way, it goes back. And um, anyway, here we are a year later. For some people, it's been terrible and they've seen their business die off. Um, they've had to close up. They've had to move into another industry. Um, they've had to downsize. For others, it's been an unexpected boom time. I mean, I read the other day on CBC that Alberta's tech sector has been thriving this past year. So for those of you who have, this, is, this has been, you know, a wonderful experience in, in many ways. I think, you know, the only certainty we know this year is uncertainty. It's kind of like the weather. I mean, it's, I think, 19 degrees here in Toronto today, um, but it's going to snow sometime this weekend. So that's spring, that's Canada. <clears throat> but I think that's also what entrepreneurship and, and being an entrepreneur and that soul of an entrepreneur really is about. So I, I just want to take a poll here and, 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 and you know, pop your, your thoughts or your responses in the group chat. How are you feeling right now? Are you good? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Or are you just plain tired? Let me, let, let, let's hear what you have to say in the chat. <clears throat> I, I'll tell you how I'm doing. I am feeling cautiously optimistic with just a veneer of pessimism that's, that's eaten through me. I mean, my own work, I was telling John before, you know, consists of being a journalist, writing books, writing articles, taking those books, going out on the road and speaking about them. Um, I've been able to write the books, but I haven't been able to go and speak. I had a book that came out, this book, Soul of an Entrepreneur, last April, right in the heart of everything. And, you know, 
it did not get the attention or sales that I thought it did because it was in the middle of a crisis. I've had other great things happen to me this year. Um, uh, and, and it really made me think as I was talking about what it means to be an entrepreneur and the feeling of that and the reality of it and, and doing interviews about it in events like this. You know, I, I was thinking about it from my own context in my own life. What, what are we talking about? You know, how, how do entrepreneurs get through things like this, through tough times? How do we keep going and reignite that entrepreneurial spirit when it gets beaten down, when it gets challenged? And I guess that's the question of where do we go from here, right? The simple answer is a term that a lot of people hear uh, all the time, and it's, it's one that's especially applicable for entrepreneurs, and that's resilience. Resilience. My wife's a career coach. Every day I hear her on the phone, something, something resilience, resilience. Um, so where does resilience, like what is resilience, right? That we all need that resilience. We all need a little bit of that tasty, sweet resilience, which is a great term, but what does that actually look like and where does it come from? And how can we kind of tap into ourselves and build it up? That's what I want to talk about today. Um, where does entrepreneurial spirit resilience come from? And how can we use it to get us through this crisis and into what lies beyond it? So it's time to dig deep. This is not just me yakking at a uh, mere reflection of myself, which is actually what I'm seeing now. And um, it's always a very strange thing to see, really screws with your ego. Um, uh, but this is a participatory conversation. There's about 140 of you here. And I want you to ask questions. I want you to make comments. I want you to share your own experiences in the chat. Um, John is here somewhere in the background, or in Edmonton at least. Uh, and he, there he is, with his behind that. His mother-in-law painted that painting and it's for sale, by the way. Um, the, soul, the true soul of an entrepreneur. Uh, so, you know, John's gonna be moderating that and he'll, he'll call those questions up when I ask. But I want you to feel free to share your, your real thoughts and your feelings in the chat. Um, and I think the end goal is, you know, maybe to learn a little thing, but really to have a conversation with each other and start that conversation that you can all continue later uh, in one way or another. Ready? can't hear you so i guess the answer is yes whether you want to or not so john thank you for those two beautiful thumbs um first of all this is the question that i get the most and so i always like to jump into it what is an entrepreneur right it's an honest question because it's one that really has become sort of a weighted thing oh you know entrepreneurs the university of alberta school of entrepreneurship we want to build more entrepreneurs what the world needs is more entrepreneurs well what what exactly do we mean like that? Is it an inventor and an innovator, someone who um, creates a gadget, a device, Steve Jobs, who made this, uh, or Elon Musk, who made some, you know, rocket ship or, uh, or, or electric car? Is it a super wealthy, super successful individual? Daryl Katz, owner of the Oilers, you know, made millions and millions of dollars in business. Um, or is it some larger than life loudmouth like, uh, you know, Dragon Den's Kevin O'Leary, which, you know, God help me, some people think is the, the vision of an entrepreneur. Um, is an entrepreneur, do they have to be sort of a corporate leader and a CEO and a, and a, and a head of a, a, a certain size company? Or can they be a small business owner? Can they be, uh, you know, the mom and the pop who owns a coffee shop or a bookstore or a small consulting company or a small, you know, software development firm, a, a one-person business? Can, can it be someone who does it for passion, maybe self-expression, like John's mother-in-law painting her pictures? Um, or even someone who does it as a lifestyle business, you know, a, a, a ski store out in Banff or in Jasper uh, that someone wants to do because they want to be close to the mountains. So... Take a moment and just think for a second. And, and, and if you have an idea, even if it's a one word thing, I see people already throwing things up here in the, in the chat. What, what's your definition of an entrepreneur? Mr. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> Literally the least thing that Kevin O'Leary is wonderful. Someone's willing to take risks. Someone who's positive and has passion. Um, uh, you know, let, let, let's hear it and, 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 you know, reflect your own circumstance about it. What makes you an entrepreneur? And and also, I mean, think about this and maybe put it in there. Why did you actually become one? John, I see your face. 
there was also a comment about innovators uh, yeah. being that individual, you know, the eureka moment that that's not that that's that's a fiction. Yes, yes, that is. Yeah. So, so you know, before we get to the that and the, the idea of the Steve Jobs, I mean, where does this where does entrepreneur even come from? Where does the word come from? So, for those of us who attended Canadian public French immersion, you may realize that it is a French word, entrepreneur. Sounds much better. That's about the limits of my education in the Ontario public school system. Um, the word had sort of been around in medieval France for you know a couple hundred years it meant in various ways a military leader someone who literally was an undertaker whether you're digging graves or just you did something uh, the, the leader of an orchestra was for the broad category and um a man brought it into the realm of economics so richard cantillon was this french irish economist in paris um 390 years ago he writes a book, um, which is a series of essays about the economy, uh, dies, the book gets published 30 years later. And one of the chapters is about, about the entrepreneur. And he says, there are two distinct classes of people in the economy. There are those who worked for fixed wages, the, someone who has a job and a boss and a salary, and the rest are entrepreneurs. And the entrepreneur, he said, was everyone from the beggar in the street to the poor farmer taking their pumpkins to the market to the wealthy merchant that's sending ships across oceans in in, in a highly risky venture to to try to make you know millions and millions of of dollars or francs or whatever it was in gold. Um, and he said, what unites them all is the the fact that they're willing to take a risk of not being paid today for the hope of some better reward tomorrow. Um, and, and so to, to boil it down, I mean, the entrepreneur in Cantillon's word then, as in now, you know, 400 years later, is kind of the same, right? If you take the broad definition of it, anyone who works for themselves is their own boss. It's defined by two key things. And these are the things we're going to talk about today. Risk and freedom. Those are the ingredients that every single entrepreneur whether you're someone who works for themselves, like me, whether you're Elon Musk or Daryl Katz or even Mr. Wonderful. Risk and freedom are those two key ingredients. And they're the two key things to understanding, not just entrepreneurs, but the core of the entrepreneurial subset and the source of that resilience. So let's break it down. What do I mean by risk and freedom? Well, let's start with risk, right? What is risk? Um, I'm not going to get into the financial definition of it, because that will put everyone to sleep. Simply put, risk is the cost of being an entrepreneur. It's what makes entrepreneurs different from those who aren't. You know, roughly speaking, about 10% of the population in Canada and the U.S. are entrepreneurs in the broadest sense, right? They, they 10% of people work for themselves. The other 90% have jobs and bosses and salaries. So what is it that separates it? It's, it's, you know, when people talk about it, they say, oh, it'd be so great to work for myself one day. It's amazing. You work for yourself. You own your own business. That's my dream. But I'm not sure. How do you do that? I couldn't do that. It, it just seems like too much of a risk. The risk is what keeps them out, right? And when we're talking about the risk, mostly and initially, I think many people think about that, the, the sort of obvious one, right? Financial risk. The risk that the money you have will not be there, that you will, in Conte's definition, you know, you, you, you risk being paid today for the hope of tomorrow, and that tomorrow doesn't come. Right? It comes with a lot less money than it does. This year, we've seen that risk come home to roost very quickly. The pandemic has taken a huge toll on entrepreneurs and small businesses across Canada and across the world. Um, uh, and it's not just people's paychecks months to months, it's their investments, it's their savings, it's their retirement plans. Um, all of that is, is on the line and all of that's the truth. And, and, you know, that risk is serious. I mean, I saw this with myself, right? I write books and I do speaking and speaking for the past decade has made up 60 to 70 percent of the dollars that uh, i claim to the cra every year um and that went from tens of thousands of dollars the year before to you know much much 
less uh, this year. And that that was, you know, a year ago, instantly overnight evaporated. So thank you, Innovation Alberta, for um, having me here and paying me. Um, uh, but you see it with all sorts of other businesses. I mean, here in Toronto, I walked down the street. I live in, it is, you know, brown paper on windows after brown paper on windows after brown paper on windows. I'm sure it's no different in Calgary and Edmonton and Red Deer and wherever you are in, in, in the province. Um, and, you know, I, I think this is something that even outside of this crisis, we know as entrepreneurs, right? The, the financial risk is there. We all know people who in the technology startup business, and many of you are, you know, failure is failure is good. Failure is a normal thing. Well, you know the financial consequences of those failures. When people's startups don't work out, often it's backed by lines of credit. Those lines of credits are backed by their mortgages. People have put their savings into it. They put their hope into it. You know, people have done without salaries for years, and that risk is real. People have to sell their homes. People have to, you know, take their kids out of private school. People have to restart their retirement savings because they've drained it. Um, I think that financial risk is something that we we can see in a very stark way. You know, a couple of years ago, I spoke to a man named Tarek Haddad. The Haddad family had a leading chocolate manufacturing business in Damascus, Syria for 30 years and had put millions of dollars into that business and were starting to export across Europe. And when a government airstrike blew up their factory and the business instantly was destroyed, that was it. All that money, all those years of investment, the investment that they made in the equipment, the factory, the brand, the investments that they made in the lives of their employees was was gone. There was no plan B, right? All chips were on the table and the table was quite literally blown up. Um, there is a, a man that I wrote about in the book. Um, he's a, a, a computer scientist. He's been doing startups. I think he's on his seventh startup now uh, at a Boston, taught at MIT, taught at Harvard. Brilliant man, John Klippinger. You know, he's worked on linguistics and you know the precursors of AI for four decades. And he said, you know, he's had five of those six startups go under. He said, when that ha happens, you just instantly turn gold to lead and it hurts. It really hurts. So, you know, I, I think back to this past year and uh, there's this interesting entrepreneur that I've spoken with recently. His name is Nav Sangha. Nav um, was a tech guy. He had a bunch of companies. He'd sold them. He'd, he'd done okay. And he decided, like many people, that his latest venture would be into restaurants. So as, you know, he gets into his third year of the restaurant business, the pandemic hits, and he sees instantly business not just slow down, not just get a hit, but completely disappear. And, and, and almost, you know, instant bankruptcy is, is what's on the table. Um, he's on the edge of it. All the money him and his partners have put into the restaurants, everything that's on it, he's on the edge of it. And, you know, it's not like there's VC funders that he can just say sorry to. There's no wealthy investors that will back him out. He can't walk away from it. And the three restaurants in Toronto he still has to pay rent. So that financial risk is, is real for him. And I want to get back to, to NAB in a bit. But I want to ask you again, you know, here we are, March of 2021. What is the biggest financial risk you now face? Um, if you're willing to share that, you know, put it, put it in, the, in the comments or, or, or chat with each other. Or just, just hold it in your head and, and think about it. What is the biggest financial risk that you're thinking about individually right now with yourself and your business? Um, so financial risk is an obvious one. Um, yes, John. Uh, no, I just wanted to pop in and say you know, the, there's one comment about yes. risk can be minimized. Minimized is the is the uh, is the, the the important word there with thorough research and planning. But what are some ways that people can planning and research and, and research is great, but when COVID comes along, you, you can't anticipate that. What are ways that we can mitigate those sorts of things? Interesting. Um, I'm going to talk about that actually right now. So uh, we didn't plan this out either, everyone, audience. Um, uh, but John just asked the perfect question, which is why um, he's not a risk to have here. He's quite the opposite, actually. Um, yeah, th this, this gets into the core of what that risk does, right? Because the other risk that, that people face, aside from the financial risk, is the risk to health. And, and that comes from stress. Now, there is research that's been done. Uh, over the past decade about what 
types of different stresses there are. And we think about stress as a bad thing, but actually there's normal stresses and good stresses in the life of business and the life of an entrepreneur. Positive stresses, motivating stresses. Uh, this is the excitement. I have a new idea for something. This business, you know, I, I really want to leave and start at this business is, 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 is something that could be really interesting. It could change things. And, and I think it could be actually a lucrative thing too. Or when you have a breakthrough in a product idea or an idea that gets picked up by someone and you actually have a meeting lined up, there's potential, right? That stress that keeps you up at night thinking, brimming with excitement and ideas, that's good stress. That is a, that is a positive stress. That's a motivating stress. And we've all felt, felt this as entrepreneurs. Actually, it's the thing that often gets us into being entrepreneurs. It's like the honeymoon phase of being an entrepreneur. You're like, oh, I'm going to start a business and you can only think of the good things that are going to. But the other side of it are what are called hindrance stresses. And hindrance stresses, to the comment um, that, that John spoke about, are generally things that are out of our control, especially for entrepreneurs who tend to be kind of control freaks. Um, when you are the Haddad family, you have a chocolate business in Syria for 20 years, you can invest all sorts of money trying to think of health regulations and, you know, how can you mitigate the risk of cocoa prices and butter prices and palm oil prices going up? And how can you deal with tariffs and getting into these external markets? And here you, you don't, you can't mitigate the risk of a civil war breaking out in the country where you are and a missile falling on your factory and blowing it up. Um, uh, you know, I talked to a, a, cause you're in Alberta, I'm going to talk about a cattle rancher. I talked to a cattle rancher in, uh, Northern California, Seth Nitschke, sort of a one man grass fed beef farming operation. And he said, you know, the, the things that are stress him out most is not when a cow gets, you know, killed by a coyote and, um, you know, when he has to drive his truck into town, it breaks down. He can deal with those. He can fix them. It's things he can't control. He can't control the global price of beef. He can't control what competitors in Brazil and Uruguay are doing with their cattle because he's thousands of miles away and has, has no way of dealing with that, right? That is something that just he can't deal with. And that stress is what keeps him up at night. Now, I know people who've been in the ad tech business and base their entire business around the way that Facebook was working. And Facebook's like, hey, we're changing our algorithm. Sorry. And that's it. Their business is done. There's there's nothing they thought they could have done there. There was no way, perhaps they could have mitigated that risk, but you know, often there isn't. And, and that was it, it was, it was done. So, you know, when you think of someone like Nav um, here in Toronto with these three restaurants, very cool restaurants, getting great reviews, you know, he has to deal with the risk of chefs leaving, he has to deal with the risk of food prices, to deal with the risk of health inspectors, of landlords and leases and, and, you know, various things that, that anyone running a restaurant has to deal with, lawsuits, liability, tons of stresses, tons of risks that that um, uh, uh, cause stress. But, you know, the hindrance stress that comes from when you are powerless and a pandemic closes down every restaurant everywhere, no matter how well you're looking at the rules, and then Donny regulations change back and forth, it's entirely out of your hand. And, and that feels frustrating. I mean, this is where we are later, right? We're stressed by forces that are out of our control. I was freaking out yesterday because I had to give this talk from home and my kids were sent home from school. And I was like, what am I going to do? There would be children literally crawling on my neck right now uh, until I realized that my you know, next door neighbor had this empty basement apartment that she couldn't rent. That was her risk that she didn't foresee either. Um, you know, we, we can rage at it. We can write angry letters to politicians. We can go on Twitter and scream into the air. We can just go outside and scream to the air. But we're still left feeling alone and powerless. And I think as entrepreneurs, that's really hard because we're doers. The, the thing that separates entrepreneurs, the willingness to take on that risk and do something with it. But in a situation like this, or when there's a war, or when there's a natural disaster, an ice storm, or I spoke to you know uh, hairdressers in New Orleans for the book that had everything washed away by Hurricane Katrina. There's no insurance. They're black women. They couldn't get insurance. And that's it. You know, 20, 30 years of investments just drown in water, right? What do you do? What do you do? The effect on health we can see for this type of stress is tremendous. It leads to depression. It leads to substance abuse, marital strife, heart attacks. I mean, my 
grandfather in, in Montreal in the Jewish garment business was incredibly unsuccessful in a string of businesses. And he died of a heart attack at 67. And yeah, maybe it was all the Montreal smoke mediate or the, you know, two packs of cigarettes a day, but the stress of that, those failures, the stress of the risk that he was constantly undertaking in the sweater factory and the dress factory and, and all these things was really, really ate up. And, and, and I think many of us have felt this this year. And this stress, this is normal, right? This doesn't go away after COVID. Um, so how do we deal with it? The answer is, is how you deal with stress in many other parts of your life. It's all the good things that we know we should be doing that we probably don't. Regular exercise, you know, good diet, meditation, therapy, talking to people, um, there's no surprises and, and they all help because they're the things that help you deal with that externality that you can't necessarily change. I, I, I'm interested to know right now, what is the biggest stress you're facing? I mean, I know some of you are doing better than others, right? Some people may, may have, be having their best year ever. What is the biggest stress you have faced over the past year and you're facing currently? And what's helped you deal with it? And what hasn't? Let's see what comes up in the, in the shot, the shot. Uh, in the Q&A, someone has responded that working from home nice. is a huge stress and challenge, uh, especially when there's two parents working at home. And as in your case, the kids have to come home as well. Yeah, that has been... Um, I'm writing a new book now, which looks at our experience of the past year. And I think the assumption that you know, the future of work is remote work from home has really been challenged by the reality of that. Uh, and it's been incredibly stressful and continues to be incredibly stressful. There's just an element of it that does not go away. Um, and I, this is coming from someone who's worked from home his entire career. So the other stress that this leads into, and, and the other risk that this leads into in a bigger way, is the risk to the ego. And I know that's a sort of big term, right? But the reality is that when you're an entrepreneur, you don't just have a job. Your work is intertwined deeply with your sense of self and your identity, right? And because of that, your life and the way that work affects it and the stresses and the risks makes it into a roller coaster ride. You feel every nauseating twist and turn. When I was interviewing Seth, the, the rancher in, in California, you know, having a PBR in his, his backyard, he said, well, it's not just a roller coaster ride. It's like a roller coaster ride after you've eaten a burrito and drank three beers uh, or in, you know, a prairie oyster and a Caesar in um, Alberta parlance. Um, uh, and, and it really does feel like that. You feel everything so personally. Why is that? It, there was a study a couple of years ago out of Finland and they took entrepreneurs and, you know, people who weren't entrepreneurs and they put them in an MRI machine and they were talking to them and showing them images about, different things, family, work, life. And what they saw was that the entrepreneur, when you spoke about their business, the same part of their brain lit up when you spoke about their family, their parents, their spouses, their children, their pets, right? And, and, and what's the truth behind that? The truth is that for many entrepreneurs, as much as we love our business and it gives us meaning and identity, it can actually lead us to lose sight of what is real and what's worth in life. I mean, who here, maybe just like put a little hand up or a, you know, yes or whatever, who here is, has, has honestly referred to their business as their baby at one of life or the, my business is my wife or my business is my husband or, you know, whatever. Um, who, who here has done that? Just, just, you know, throw it out there if you have or nod to yourself or, or take a shot of a Caesar and, and eat a burrito. Um, uh, you know, it, that's, that's something that people do, right? And it's seen as this badge of pride. But here's the truth. Your business is not your baby. Your business is not your mother. Your business is not your husband. It's a business. It's an economic idea and structure that you have, and you put a lot of effort and care into it. But it won't love you. It won't hug you. It won't make you snuggle at night as you read it a story. When you're feeling down, it won't visit you in the hospital when you're sick. You are not your business, right? You are an individual. And you run the business and you put a lot of yourself into it, but you are not your business. Because what happens? Business, especially as an entrepreneur, it's full of high 
highs and lows. It's full of the thrill of battle. It's this fight for survival and, and it's thrilling and there's adrenaline and dopamine. And in that, in that journey, the biggest risk is losing your sense of self. You think it's you versus the world, but it can be incredibly lonely and isolating and dangerous, especially when it's actually good, right? How many entrepreneurs do you know in, in, in the startup scene, in the tech scene, in, in, in your various cities in Alberta, whose business and, and obsession with it led them to failing marriages, divorce, alienation, um, substance abuse problems, right? John Clippinger, who's you know, approaching 80, he blames his divorce squarely on his third business because he lost sight of his wife and his daughter um, who he's reconciled with. Um, but, you know, it, it was all about that startup and all about changing the world. And the only thing that changed was John's life for the worse. I, I think about it a lot, you know, friends of mine here in Toronto as well. Um, and and there's one story I, I, I think about a couple of years ago. I spoke to an entrepreneur in Colorado. His name was Bart Loring. He had a big software company. And I said, you know, tell me about the company. He's like, oh, well, we just did 250 million this year. And, you know, we're getting this next round of series c funding and it's going to be you know sell partners and all these big things and i said well what's the hardest time you've had as an entrepreneur he's like right now he's like i have shingles i'm about to get you know i'm trying not to get a divorce my wife and i are going to counseling um it's just absolutely terrible because as we're growing the pressure of that is taking my time away from all the things so the, the worst time for him was the best time the, probably the time that you all look at him and you're like oh 250 million dollars us in revenue wow i would kill for that and he's going toward a billion dollars i would kill for that but he would have killed for something that probably would have saved his family. John, I love this. I love you popping in here. I'm just lurking. Uh, one of the uh, comments that came in through the back end here from uh, Scott is, as a challenge is developing uh, trust and relationships with clients and potential clients when face-to-face -face is limited. Yeah. I mean, that is that is something that's so specific to this year. And there's been tons of research that's showing that there's just a limitation to this, right? Like there is there is a limitation to this world. You know, next time perhaps I could I could come and and speak to you and you know in one of those rubber chicken lunches, but we could talk afterward. You would laugh ideally, right? Um, you would cry ideally. Uh, you would get a sense of actually what what that thing. And and what is you know getting back to the. the that idea of, of that risk to the ego, I mean, what does it show? It shows this need that we need a grounding. We need a grounding in a certain sort of reality um, as entrepreneurs to counter that risk, the risk to our ego. Because even if your business fails and it's out of your control, that grounding is what helps you get beyond the loss. If you lost a business this past year, maybe you were doing you know technolo technology services for the restaurant business or the hospitality business. I spoke to Tourism Alberta last year. I mean, this brutal for those people. It's just brutal. But, you know, so much of that's not your fault. And even if it is your fault, even if you screwed up and didn't assess the right risk or got in bed with the wrong partner or, um, you know, purchased the wrong inventory or whatever, you know, if you can deal with that and deal with accepting that failure and not let it destroy your ego and process it and separate the business from yourself, that is the source of entrepreneurial resistance. It's the well that you can draw upon. It's the battle scars that help you move forward. And that's what actually strengthens the entrepreneurial spirit. So, you know, the Haddad family came to Canada as refugees after their business was destroyed. They ended up in the tiny town of Antigonish, Nova Scotia, which I believe is the home of hockey player Al McInnes. Um, uh, and, you know, Tarek Haddad was a doctor, but he couldn't practice because he didn't have qualifications. And they're like, what do we do? We're living in this tiny house in this tiny little town, you know, in Nova Scotia. Um, what do we do? Maybe we should make chocolates. And they started making them out of their kitchen. And now Peace by Chocolate is a multi-million dollar company. They're exporting their chocolate all over the world. It's all based around the idea that they're the Syrian family. Like they took the experience that happened to them, which is the far worse than any of us can imagine here in a beautiful, peaceful country like Canada. And they turned that into the thing that drove them, right? It would, he said, you know, doing this was nothing compared to surviving that war and nothing compared to getting out. You know, the, the, the African-American women that I talked to in New Orleans who reopened their salons and built some of those into huge hair businesses that sell all over North America, they said, you know, after Katrina, if we were able to 
get in there with shovels and dig out moldy things and destroy it, you know, and, and rebuild it and reopen those hair salons. We could do anything, right? I mean, there there is that, you know, yada, 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 failure is good, failure is good. No, failure sucks. But learning to fail is a good lesson. It's an important thing. And I think, you know, that's what we're going to have to get toward. I mean, as I talked to John Clippinger, that software developer and, and, and technological thinker in his 80s, starting his latest company, he said, you know, those failures are burned into my prefrontal cortex. Every time I get an instinct for something that's bad, its brain says, don't go there. It, it hurts like fire. If you can get through this, you know, it will, it will help you get through anything behind that. And that, that's one of the keys of resilience. John. Uh, Sanjay had an interesting question about, uh, and you may not be able to answer this, but she, uh, it says, does genetics play a major role in the birth of an entrepreneur? Does entrepreneurship run in the blood? And if yes, to what extent? Have you spoken to anybody about that in your travels writing yeah. your books? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good question. Uh, genetics, um, I don't think so. Um, I don't think there's an entrepreneur gene, but there is definitely what's what one researcher in New Zealand called uh, entrepreneurial legacy. And it is kind of the inherited predisposition to entrepreneurship because you grew up in a house of entrepreneurs. My dad worked for himself. My Both my grandparents worked for themselves. Um, and so in my life, being an entrepreneur was simply something you were able to do. You know, when I, I graduated, I applied to journalism schools. Nobody would take me. I applied to the Globe and Mail. I applied to the CBC. They're like, who the hell are you? We don't want you. And I was like, well, I guess I could just start writing on my own. That was a possibility because that had been modeled to me. And I think you see that with a lot of immigrant families. Um, so perhaps that's where that genetic idea comes in, but it doesn't, act, does, it's not as though it's one group or another. Um, you know, immigrants like the Haddads often turn to entrepreneurship due to a lack of another option. You're not allowed to practice medicine here, even though you were a doctor in Syria, but you can make chocolate, you can start a business, right? And so I think it's that question of seeing, you know, if you grew up around entrepreneurs, if you see people as entrepreneurs, it's normal, right? It's it's a normal thing. And perhaps if your family were all employed in, you know, professional jobs that, you know, you go to work and, you know, you get your credits and this is this is where it is and you get your job and one day you get the gold watch, um, perhaps that's normalized for you as well. So I think that's that's where that comes in. That's an excellent question. Um, so so I, I want to get back to this this idea of support, right? Because what helps build that resilience? What helps strengthen you against those risks, your ego, the risks to your mind, the risks to your identity? Again, like the exercise and, and all those other things before, it's, it's those same good things that we know. And, and we've really realized this past year, right? Community, family, friends, our kids, when they're not, home all day. Our parents, um, for me, it's my book club, which is meeting tonight, and I can't actually go into the, my friend's backyard and do it. Um, for other people, it might be their curling team to, to hit on the sort of red deer left bridge side of things. Um, for other people, it could be church or synagogue or or your, your temple or other face. It could just be a group of friends you go out and drink with, right? The most important thing is each other. That is one of the key to building that resilience because it it doesn't happen alone. And entrepreneurs tend to feel alone. Even when you're the head of a big company and you employ 30, 40 people, you feel alone, right? It, nobody can understand me because I'm the only one at the top. It's you against the world, but it's not. Entrepreneurs have to talk to other people. They especially have to talk to other entrepreneurs, right? There, there, there's all this talk about, oh, it's an ecosystem. The ecosystem, you know, we're in the Alberta innovation ecosystem. Well, an ecosystem is actually an interrelation of all sorts of different species and creatures, and they interact with each other. And it's not just this competitive Darwin thing. They support each other, right? There's all this research showing that it's not just one tree and another tree. All the trees are connected, and they support each other in different species of trees as well. Um, uh, and in Ecosystem isn't just networking events or, or a way of a pipeline to get sort of, you know, credits or whatever it is. It's a community. And a community is a thing that we crave more than anything this year, right? So how do you support? you got to learn from others. You have to offer help to others. You also have to just listen to others and let them know they're not alone because that's how you build those deeper relationships. That is a far more important way of networking than, hi, uh, will you be my friend on LinkedIn? Sure, I'll be your friend on LinkedIn. What does it matter? And click, 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 click. Um, so here's a question. Who have you been turning to help for? Who have you been turning to for support this year? Who, have you, who here needs someone? 
to talk with about something specific or some of the risks that they're going through. And who here is ready to talk to them? If you are, say it in the chat, put your email in there or go on the Alberta Innovates website. And there's all sorts of resources that, that support entrepreneur and you could you know, harass John about what those are. Um, so that's risk. That's part one of the talk. I, John, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll pop a question in here before we get to part two, which is freedom. Sweet freedom. Uh, well, I think the, uh, the overall comment about, uh, you know, entrepreneurial legacy, that inherited predisposition, it's, it's fascinating because, uh, um, Craig commented earlier, he goes, well, nobody in my, all of my family was, you know, working for someone else. What happened to me? You know, and it's interesting because I, you know, I feel that burn and that desire to want to kind of explore entrepreneurialism in some way. Just haven't figured out what that way yeah. is yet. <laughs> okay. Well, now that your bosses have heard that, you're fired. So uh, you better figure it out. <laughs> um, Craig, it's, you know, again, like all these studies, is there a predisposition toward it? Um, it may be. But, you know, the re reality is this is what someone people always say. Who makes an entrepreneur? What does an entrepreneur look like? There are entrepreneurs that are black. There are entrepreneurs that are white. There are entrepreneurs that are young. There are entrepreneurs that are old. There are entrepreneurs who are rural. There are entrepreneurs who are in cities. There are entrepreneurs who are extremely shy introverts. There are entrepreneurs who are like Mr. Fabulous or whatever the hell his name is, you know, super loud extroverts. Anyone can be an entrepreneur as long as they're willing to accept the risk and part two of the talk, the freedom. So what is the freedom, right? The risk is always there, but so is the freedom. There's no guarantee of success in entrepreneurship. I think we all know that. Um, there's no guarantee of money and there's no guarantee of fame. But there is one thing that entrepreneurship guarantees, and that is freedom. Freedom is the principal benefit of entrepreneurship, right? What is that freedom? It's the freedom to work. It's the freedom to work in the way that you want to. You know, before this, if you wanted to wear sweatpants to work, you could probably only do it if you were an entrepreneur or, you know, worked at Lululemon. Um, entrepreneurship is unique because it offers people self-expression through business. And when you're an entrepreneur, the business inevitably reflects who you are. What, what's interesting is that we're seeing this past year, you know, all these people have lost their jobs they're all kind of starting the businesses they always wanted to, right? No one's like, oh, I lost my job and I'm starting something I really hate. Um, it's the bakery, it's the flower shop, it's the coaching business, it's the independent consulting business based on what they've done before. It's the software development studio after working for a sort of a larger software company. Um, or even the restaurant, the, the takeout thing. You know, Nav, as I said, um, Nav Sangha in Toronto, he came from the software business. He did, he was successful, he sold his thing and he got into you know, he sold it to Yelp and he got into the restaurant business. Nobody goes into the restaurant business to make money. That is literally the dumbest thing you could do. No offense to anyone in the restaurant business. You know, it's like a 90% failure rate. It's fun. It's cool. You like food. You like people. You like socializing. You like drinking. You like nights out. It would be fun, right? Um, you know, my brother this past year, he worked in commercial real estate, part of the cannabis business, and things were not going so well in the cannabis business and not so well in commercial real estate this year. And now he's working on, with partners in Edmonton, a space mining business. Um, he's going to do mining on the moon. And he's so excited about this thing, which is the craziest idea he's ever had, or the riskiest thing, but he has the freedom. Like, you can't apply for a job to mine on the moon. He has the freedom to just do that. And he's so intoxicated with that freedom. You know, if you want money, don't become an entrepreneur. Go to law school or, or, or go get an MBA or, or go get a job at, you know, a very good place and work up the ranks. And the economists study this. They say, if you want the best sort of life, you know, still the best way is like climb that corporate ladder and work your way up. Um, but entrepreneurship is full of lawyers who left. I, I, the second book I wrote was about food trends. And I wrote a whole part of it on the cupcake boom. And it was like... 30% of the cupcake shops that have been opened around the world are opened by lawyers who, who were frustrated and left their practice, which is a very expensive way to get an education about cupcakes. Um, the disadvantages of, you know, of, of entrepreneurship and freedom are obvious now. Right? If you own a business that relies on people being in person, you know, unmasked, a fitness club, um, a yoga studio, hotels, restaurants, Right. If you own a bobbing for steaks restaurant in Jasper or, you know, you host cuddle parties or 
I don't know, you know, you, you want to want to cruise ships. It's, it's really difficult, but freedom is kind of the best advantage all entrepreneurs have right now. Um, because an entrepreneurial freedom fundamentally means that you can do things that you want and you deem necessary. You can take those risks without asking permission, right? You can take back the initiative right away. You can shift, you can pivot, you can change on a dime. You can deploy your assets and talents wherever you see opportunity and you can seize that opportunity in, in whatever way you can. So, you know, the Haddad's, they got to Canada. They didn't know what they could do. They're like, okay, let's make chocolate. Boom, it, it, it was done, right? I, my wife has a friend, her name's Jal. And over the past 25 years, she's built up an outdoor education business here in Toronto that's incredibly successful. She takes thousands and thousands of students every year out on camping and canoe trips from all over the world, mostly from private schools in North America, but from Korea and, and South Africa and the United States who come up to Ontario and go to the Northwest Territories and takes them all on trips. Last summer, couldn't do a single trip. COVID, no one's coming in. No one's going out on those trips. The canoes were shelved in her warehouse and, and, and there was nothing she could do. And she managed a way to turn that into a business of doing online resilience training and teaching these same kids the principles that they would have learned by portaging and building a fire or getting eaten by mosquitoes, right? You see that with you know some of the e-commerce firms here in Canada, Shopify or, or Calgary's Helsium, um, which have boomed in the surging demand for e-commerce and, and services. But they've also seen that opportunity to move more aggressively and, and more concertedly into helping thousands of new and nascent small businesses grow through their services, credit card processing. Um, this is what happened with NAV. So you know, here NAV is a year ago. Restaurants are shuttered, right? And these are not like places that do sandwiches and you can do a lot of takeout. They're like, they're real dining experiences. But he saw an opportunity and, and he had a sort of nascent AI business that he was kind of working on as the platform for back end restaurant stuff. But what he saw was that, you know, they were trying to get some of their food out the door and Uber Eats and, you know, just eat and uh, skip the dishes were saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll deliver your food, but we we're going to take 30% of each order and you're going to have to jack up your prices by you know 20 percent to sort of cover this and he, he did the math and he saw that m most restaurants were not making any money on all this delivery and delivery was suddenly becoming 90 percent of it we said well there's no reason why i couldn't build software like this that could work for my restaurants and there's no reason why that software couldn't work for other restaurants and it doesn't have to work by this business model because I don't have a venture capitalist to eat and I don't have to, um, I don't have to, you know, build up my shareholder value. I don't need to take 30%. I could just do it as a flat rate. And so we built this company called Ambassador, uh, ambassador.ai, if you want to look at it. And it's essentially a, you know, platform that allows restaurants to control their own online ordering and delivery and, and, and feedback with customers. Uh, it's a flat fee per month. You know, I think it's like $90 a month or something like that. And he started it just with his three restaurants. That was the idea. Tested it out. And within a few months, he had 100 or more of the best restaurants in Toronto. And now they're looking to expand, you know, around Canada and North America. He not only found a way that was an opportunity for business and to make money, and I don't think the business makes tons of money, um, but what he was able to do was take control of his business and his life. He was able to, to accept the risk, learn from it, build from his resilience, draw from his resilience as an entrepreneur of, of what he'd gone through and, and use the freedom he had as an entrepreneur to actually take action with that. I mean, the reality is even now, even in the heart of the pandemic as we're entering this third wave, or maybe you guys are better than us in Alberta, um, short of the health guidelines, short of what they're saying, nothing's limiting you. In fact, it's, it's a very you know, free time to sort of try things, right? Leases are low. You know, there's lots of people who are interested in opportunities and, and, and there's just this idea of experimentation out there. You're free to risk, you're free to create, you're free to innovate. So here's my question for some of you. I mean, how have you used your own entrepreneurial freedom in the past year to not only adapt and survive, but maybe try something new? Name, name one thing. I, I, I'm interested to hear, you know, a, a couple of, of stories or things that you've done, even if it's a small thing within, within your own business. Rebecca added something there in the group chat, able to pivot and shift yeah, to make it work. She started to, 
Yeah. And Trish, Trish shifted from uh, lost her hiking company to focusing on uh, her uh, her background in marketing and communications. Interesting. I mean, I think I'm all of sure. us have. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. No, no, no. You go ahead. <laughs> um, well, you know, the, the, I mean, that's really interesting, right? And and I think what what it speaks to. And what we see is kind of the what I would say is the final value of of or sorry the final freedom that entrepreneurs have and and that's your values right your values is deciding what's important and shaping your work according to that and and again entrepreneurs have a unique ability to do that when you're an employee you may have personal values but your values are generally dictated by what the company believes and its policies the people who are the entrepreneurs behind that um, uh, you know for Nav Sangha in Toronto his value was very much about the health of his community, keeping Toronto's vibrant restaurant scene alive, strengthening that community, making sure that the chefs and servers were kept employed, that the talent was there, that the ideas were there, that the food was there. And that value allowed him to, to build his business. The, the Haddad family could have built a much more lucrative, you know, bottom line driven chocolate business, but they built it, called Peace by Chocolates because it was so based around that personal value of what they'd experienced. And that's gone into all their marketing. And that value is actually the thing that is why you see it in every Sobeys and, and you see it in Whole Foods in the United States. They even brought it on the International Space Station a couple of years ago, which is pretty amazing. Um, values are easy when times are good, right? You go into a company and they have a list of them on their wall or they're on their website. Oh, integrity, grit. Uh, hard work, perseverance, customer service, blah, 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 like just tick, 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 you know, choose from your menu of values. But values are really defined when times are hard, like now. When living up to them requires true sacrifice. And you're someone like Nav, and you can make more money by taking a percentage of someone's, you know, restaurant bill, but you know it's not the right thing to do because it's going to diminish the overall community you're trying to save. We see that especially now, right? That, that you know, values for businesses are beyond just do dollars and cents. There's there's a sense of place to it, a value of people and how we treat them. And maybe that's the upside of the pandemic. I mean, we realize the value we as entrepreneurs have to communities, you know, cities like Edmonton, Calgary, Red Deer, Medicine Hat. I mean, they're, they're groups of people, their schools, their streets, their parks, their houses, but businesses are often the fabric to connect them together. It's the place where we meet. It's the place where we interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, the way you serve those people, the way you interact with them, the way your values dictate how that relationship happens, that also is a well to draw. You know, when you're an entrepreneur, you have the freedom to shape that however you want, to shape those interactions however you want, day by day, one transaction at a time. And, and how you do that will define who you are as an entrepreneur for the rest of your life. So what is that entrepreneurial freedom that you value the most? And what is the value for you as an entrepreneur that's the most important? It's going to be different for everyone, and there is no wrong answer, even if your wrong answer, even if your answer is like, I only care about making money, screw everyone else. It's the Mr. Wonderful, Mr. Fabulous, whatever he's called. Um, <laughs> finally, I, I want to get to sort of the the one key thing besides risk and freedom that linked all entrepreneurs and that original definition of, you know, Richard Contiov 400 years ago, right? It, you know, entrepreneurs have the risk and they have the freedom. But the other thing he said was, was that hope of the greater reward tomorrow. And hope is the word I want to single in on, right? Because hope is the key word for entrepreneurs. And I really do think it's the secret of the entrepreneurial spirit. And I know that sounds really cheesy, but it's true, right? The hope that this season will be better than the last. The hope that this idea is going to be the winner. The hope that this product is the one that really is going to make a difference, not just to my company, but to people's lives. That this restaurant is going to be really delicious and people are going to love the food and it'll, it'll make money. That this company is the one that's going to make me, you know, even happier and give me a better sense of purpose, that this redesign is the thing that, that will really transform the business that we have. It's the belief that today can be better than yesterday and that you can control that through your actions and, and how you face those challenges. Um, it, it's a faith in yourself fundamentally. And listen, nothing I can tell you is going to make facing the rest of this pandemic any easier or what comes after it. 
there's no secret to entrepreneurial spirit and there's no secret to the resilience. There's no shortcut. There's no magic wand. There's no book you can read. Um, it's so weird with these things because everything goes opposite. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there's no MBA you can take that's going to teach you just how to do that, right? The secret is simple. It's, it's knowing who you are. You're entrepreneurs. You've always accepted the risk. You'll always have that freedom. And you'll always rely on the hope to keep you going. So my final thing before we get into some questions, what gives you hope right now? You know, March 2021, a year into this crap. Um, what gives you hope and how are you going to share that and maybe spread it and help it grow with your fellow entrepreneurs in Alberta in the tech industry? Uh, I'd love to hear that and I'd love to see, you know, some of those interactions happen. I'm delayed on the group chat here. Oh. People are being shy. People are being shy. Um, well, there's, on, always hope. Hope. there's always hope. There's always hope. That's okay. <laughs> if we could only get this thrust you so much, then there's only up from here. Thank you, Rebecca. That's true, right? Um, uh, you know, hope has to be spread. It's in short supply these days. Trust me, just open the news. I'm feeling it too, but I think you know, talking with each other is the best thing you can do. And, and again, that idea that you're part of a community, the community of entrepreneurs, and it's not just on LinkedIn. It's not just a place to go and attend talks and, you know, maybe meet some investors. It is people who are going through the same thing as you, even if they work in entirely different companies and their circumstances are different. And I think it's that universality of it. That's that true entrepreneurial experience that we have to cultivate in each other. So thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if there's there's more of them. Um, otherwise, I'll just hang out here until I hear my kids pounding on the walls. <laughs> we do have a comment from Jeff who said there appears to be that's lots right. of money for investment now. Oh, okay, great. So that's Alberta bound. <laughs> Heading out there specifically <laughs> for watching. Uh, and there's also, we have access to incredible to technologies too. Yeah. Yeah, there is, there is, you know, there, there is always opportunity out there. Um, and I think, you know, there's always going to be the freedom to take it up and the, and the risk. I see things in the group chat. Alberta's already pivoting away from ONG into the renewables in the tech sector, which is great to see, which, uh, yeah, I've, I, 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 I've heard quite a bit about. Actually, one of the reasons my brother and his, you know, space mining company is, is is really based on that is all the talent that's there that knows how to extract resources um can be applied to this i mean there's there's you know brains and and communities of people who are eager and hungry to to do things um even when it seems you know hopeless or, or when it when it when it seems impossible to see that in, in, in one way john what gives you hope this year oh music <laughs> Um, I, I play a lot of music. I write a lot of music and record. So I have, you know, and that, that's one thing I was always thinking about as you were talking is it's so important for me to have a creative outlet. Um, and that's, that's my community, you know, to write, that's great. to play, to share that's, that. That's great. And I think that's, that's a, a key thing. I would love if you played us out with a song. That would maybe be the best way to <laughs> Well, you know, and I, and I have to say, too, I'm blessed. <laughs> I'm blessed that I have an employer that lets me, uh, you know, explore those creative outlets as well, you know, for, for video and stuff. You know, if you check out your invitation that you provided us, there's music that's wrapped around that. It's uh, courtesy of uh, yours truly. I wish we could play it Great now. comment by be, Carlos. Yeah, Carlos. Musicians and entrepreneurs have much in common. Chasing a dream. Chasing a dream. And also, you know, no one goes into music for, oh, I'm gonna make I'm gonna be Led Zeppelin and make tons of money, right? It's it's the belief in it's it's the most important thing is actually doing it. That's the reward, right? That's the freedom. Um that's that's what makes it worth it, the ability to actually do that. Yeah, I'm just gonna check the Q and A here. I think we've got uh a couple of questions. To, before we wrap it up, um, sure. one from Rebecca is, what is the most satisfying thing for you working with small businesses? Uh, 
I mean, the part of the job I, I love the most is, you know, as a journalist, um, is getting to know the individuals behind the businesses because especially the smaller businesses, um, it's so personal and so much of their personality comes through in that. And you really get to know someone in a way that you would never get to know them in any other sense of life unless you happen to be their family. And even their family, sometimes people don't bring this stuff home with them. So, um, I, I, you know, to me, it's, it's the most satisfying part of it because you really get to see that behind each business is, is a human story, right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a tale of humanity and all the things that someone's gone through that's brought them there and that, and you see it and you feel it and you taste it in their business. It, it just becomes apparent. That's why two people can have two of the exact same businesses in the same city or even on the same block and they'll be completely different. You know, that's uh, that's wonderful. And I think let's wrap it up there because we're at one o'clock and I know uh, people have busy days. Um, but, you know, the overall theme of this that I earlier on you had mentioned uh, at times entrepreneurs can feel alone and powerless. And that's difficult because, uh, you know, that's their entrepreneurs, social creatures, so to speak, risk to the ego. Has, as their work, mm -hmm. as our work is entwined with their lives and our lives. But you took all of that, those kind of dark notes, and wrapped them in a message of hope, the belief that today uh, today is, is better, will be better than yesterday. So persevere and, uh, and, and keep it up. So, yes. David, uh, thank you. Indeed. Thank you all. Uh, Cindy, you know, you're, you're, I, I just saw the, the conversation here in the chat, which is wonderful. And I was hoping to see, you know, Cindy asked, how do I know who I am as an entrepreneur? Um, I mean, that is a far deeper question than a, a chat box can ever answer. But it's, I, I think the way you have to sort of approach it is, you know, ask yourself, why do you do this, right? Why, why do you do what you do? Um, and maybe the answer is, well, I just do it because it's a good way to make a living. And I stumbled into it. But my real passion is hiking or, you know, um, collecting all of John's music. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's those honest conversations and, and I don't think we always answer it, right? We, we sort of struggle throughout our lives with that. That's okay. Admitting that's okay. And, and, you know, committing yourself to find that is, is an important thing. Um, but everyone will. And, uh, that's, that's just part of the journey of, of being an entrepreneur. That's the soul of an entrepreneur. Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. It's, um, you know, I wish I could do this in person. I look forward to the day when I can. <laughs> but at least, John, I had David. you this time. Sometimes it's just me. <laughs> this, this was a Play pleasure. <laughs> Please okay. release me. Uh, thank you Ooh. very much for, for uh, coming and speaking to us today. Hopefully next time we get you face-to-face. -face. David Sachs, a pleasure. Looking forward to reading your book. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, uh, everyone in Innovate Alberta. Um, take care. Be safe out there. We'll get through the next bit together and then summer. So I guess it'll snow in August there. <laughs> All right.